I call this meeting of the Davenport Community S School District Board of Directors to order. Director Sherwood, would you please read our vision statement? Mr. President, our vision is that education that challenges conventional thinking, prepares all students to compete in a global society, and inspires our students, parents, staff, and community to answer the question, what if? Thank you. We'll move on to the showcase. Adam, Superintendent Tate. Thank you, Mr. President. I call on Mr. Tom Green to make the presentation. Thank you for being here, Tom. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, school board presentations are often a time for buildings to highlight their efforts to increase student achievement and rest assured that Adams has been working diligently in our implementation of data teams and our district non-negotiables. We've also spent a great deal of time analyzing data, practicing think alouds, and learning about common formative assessments. While we recognize our number one priority is student achievement, the focus of tonight's presentation will be on the social and behavioral realm. The Adams staff has made a concerted effort to emphasize the district's life skills in order to build character, empathy, and a sense of community among our students. Mrs. Sarah Prizer, skills room supervisor, will share a few words on how we've positively reinforced the life skills. Third quarter can be an especially challenging time when it comes to student behavior. To positively reinforce the life skills, we have used a bucket filling incentive inspired by the book, How to Fill Your Bucket. Staff hand out shapes to students and then demonstrate positive and caring behaviors. These shapes are then put in a bucket. Once the bucket is filled, students earn rewards. Some of the rewards they received are choice seating at lunch, first to be dismissed for recess, game time with the counselor, and an extra all school recess. During the month of May, in celebration of all seven life skills, students can earn skills bucks. Skills bucks are turned into the skill center and then student council count and tally them daily. When students receive uh, or reach their final goal, they earn an all school incentive. These are a couple of the books and there's four different and then they also are in multicultural and um, in another language also. Another way in which we're building community and leadership among our students is through student council. We're proud to be one of the few elementaries that's still able to offer this opportunity. Mrs. Don Kelly, student council advisor, will share a few words about our student council. Okay. Hello. There would be a lot more student council members here today, um, but unfortunately this date is the first ball game of the season, and it's also Williams Fest, so our fifth graders are at Williams Fest learning about their future. So we thought that was very important for them to continue. But we did um, have a video of our vice president and president telling you a little bit about student council and how it affects their life. Hi, my name is Nate and I'm the student council president. Hi, my name is Frank Emanuel and I'm the student council vice president. Student council meets monthly to discuss ways to help others such as hat and mitten drive, food drive, candy grams, and Smensels. For the hat mint drive and the food drive, we give those to the homeless shelter. For the candy grams this year went to the new town kids. And the smensels that Miss Kelly bought herself will be going to Miss Corcelia's son Sammy's college fund. Student Council helps us be a better student by doing these fundraisers. The fundraisers help us by thinking about what happened to these people. But it helps to know that I am doing all that I can to help. It also helps me be more trustworthy to teachers. It also helps me because of the teamwork that we do. Okay, this is a picture of our entire student council this year, standing in our all-star hallway. This is a picture of our candidates that ran for office this year. They're up on the stage. 
Um, that is um, usually done the beginning of October. And here we are having election day. The students are asked to give a one to two minute speech about why they think that they would be um, a good candidate for office. Then the fourth and fifth grade students are sent back to their classrooms to vote and the election tallies are tallied. The last couple of years we've done that online so they've been able to learn how to use the survey monkey and do that. Oops, one of the first things that we do, I went a little farther, sorry, is the student hunger drive. Adams, at Adams we collect canned and boxed items to contribute to the West High School's hunger drive. Here you can see some of our kids collecting and boxing things up. Uh, lots of times we do uh, different incentives to help motivate the students to bring different donations. Here we had the Mallards come and visit. Um, after their visit, they left us with jerseys and uh, hockey pucks and hockey sticks, and we use those to, um, a student would give a can, they would get to put their name in a bucket, and then we drew those out at the end. And we, I think, donated maybe 29 boxes of food that year, so that helped. We also do a pajama day and a crazy hair day. If you bring a can that day, you get to participate in those fun activities. Um, and we hold back a few things and we do a second collection and have Christmas baskets for our students that are families in our building that are more needy. Student Council also donates 100 to $200 to give the meat for the basket. Each year, Student Council sells candy grams for Valentine's Day to raise money. Each year, the Student Council members discuss and decide how to, um, they can provide for the people in our community or our world. Uh, this year, we decided um, to give to the Newtown, Connecticut students, and we were able to collect about $200 for that. Our next um, thing that we do every year is the Hat and Mitten Drive. This year was our ninth annual Hat and Mitten Drive. Um, we usually collect about 200 pairs of hats, mittens, and scarves, and we donate those to local charities and churches. Um, some other things that we've done sporadically throughout the years. Last year we did um, an activity for jogging for Joplin. The students got pledges, and then the whole school went out and did a jog around the school and collected the pledges for um, the victims of the tornado in Joplin. We've done um, all-star life skill assemblies. This was a life skill assembly in October for the life skill of caring. Uh, the student council members organize and practice the skits, perform them for the school, and uh, it has to meet the life skill of that month. After the skit, we do a pep rally and celebrate our all-star students and their great behaviors. In this skit, you can see the students are showing caring by including the kids at their table in their discussions. In this skit, you can see that first the students are playing Foursquare, you can't see it very well, and they have a classmate who's sitting off to the side and upset. So they go over and ask her if she would like to join the game, and she joins them, showing caring. This is the assembly pep rally. Um, he's, here are all the people that did for something for the skit. There they're calling out the all-star letters, and the crowd calls back. And here you can see the crowd in a sea of green showing their school spirit and enjoying the pep rally. Um, planting flowers to beautify the school. We try to do this every year. Um, we had a fourth and fifth grade dance one year. That was something that the, the council members came up with. And we charged $1, and that included a drink and a snack. And we have a father of a student who's a local DJ, so he donated his time for the dance. We had a lot of those fun everyday dances that we love. Today we started selling smensels for Sammy. Smensels are smelly pencils. We provided one for each of you of different flavors. And uh, Sammy is the 18 month old son of Mrs. Corselia, who was our kindergarten teacher who passed away this year. Uh, we, w we project to be able to give about $500 to his um, college education fund. Some other places that we've donated to in the past are, oh, I can't see that, Niobe <laughs> Zoo, I'm sorry. Family Resources, that stayed hidden very well. Humane Society, St. Jude's, and the Red Cross. She did quite well adapting. This was a smart board presentation, so she's 
adapted quite well. Um, these are just a few examples of how we're preparing our students to be successful and contributing citizens, the leaders of tomorrow. We want to thank you for this opportunity to present tonight and wanted to know if you had any comments or questions for us. Anybody? Uh, Director Sherwood. Yeah, you say you have seven characteristics or, or skills that you guys uh, teach, uh, these character traits. Uh, what are those? There's the seven life skills of the Davenport Community Schools, and you're going to quiz me right now, aren't you? Uh -huh. um, caring, teamwork, responsibility, uh, initiative, perseverance, <laughs> effort, and caring. And when you say <laughs> that they're Davenport School Districts, I haven't had the sense that we have any unified life skills across the district. Uh, it sounds for, to me that you folks think that there is. Am I wrong about that? Um, maybe it's more in the world of elementary, but I know it's pretty pervasive in elementary, but I just saw some high school students helping me out here as well, so. Yeah, well, that's terrific stuff. Uh, how do you instruct in these? Um, each year, or each month, we have a different focus for the life skills, and then this um, upcoming May, we'll do all of them together, but there's, it's um, emphasized throughout your instruction throughout the day. Whenever you see students demonstrating different things, we um, reward them or praise them for that. And like Mrs. Prizer was saying, we had that one month where we were using the shapes to reinforce some of those behaviors or the skills bucks to reinforce behaviors as well. No, it's impressive. Thank you very Thank much. You. Director Crumwoody. Just quickly, uh, thank you, all of you, for the presentation. And uh, I have long been a strong supporter of elementary student consoles. I think it's a, a good training ground for the intermediate and the high schools. Uh, I've seen student consoles across this district do phenomenal things, just like you're doing, and uh, really gets them involved with the community and projects around the country. Um, so thank you for that. I, uh, I appreciate you doing that, and I'm sure all of us on the board do. Uh, Tom, when you started out, though, you said you made the statement um, there was only a few schools in Davenport that have student consoles, or were one of the few. I haven't heard a, a lot about a lot of real active student consoles. I think Adams is unique in that sense. Um, I haven't formally uh, asked the other principals and such, but in the elementaries that I've worked at, and I've also been principal, I, I haven't seen really strong and active student councils. This is one of the few. Okay, okay. Well, fortunately, or unfortunately, uh, that's too bad because I think we should, uh, we should be doing that at all of our elementary schools. So Thanks. hopefully uh, we can get the message out. Thanks. Anyone else? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks for the presentation. We'll move on to communications. Um, April 25th, 6 to 7.30 p.m. Alice Public Forum. What's the date today? Oh, 22nd. Okay, excuse me. Uh, Alice Public Forum, number one, Bluegrass Elementary Cafeteria. <coughs> April 30th, retirement dinner, 6 o'clock, social hour, 7 o'clock mm. dinner at the Radisson. April 30th, 6.30 to 8 p.m., community workshop number two on Central Pool and Auditorium at the Central Cafeteria. <coughs> May 1 at 4 p.m., policy meeting, ASC Executive Boardroom. May 1st, 6 to 7.30 p.m., Alice Public Forum number two, Eisenhower Elementary School Gym. May 2nd at 4 p.m., Legislative Advocacy Meeting, ASC Executive Boardroom. May 6th, 5.30 p.m., Committee of the Whole Meeting, ASC Jim Hester Boardroom. May 8th, 6 to 7.30 p.m., Alice and Boundaries Public Forum at Sudlow Intermediate, Large Gym. May 9th, 6 to 7.30 p.m., Alice Public Forum at Williams Intermediate, Gym. May 13th. 7 p.m. regular meeting, ASC Jim Hester Boardroom, May 14th, 6.30 to 8 p.m. Communi community Workshop number 3, Central Cafeteria, May 27th. May 27th is holiday, and we're closed May 28th at 7 p.m., which happens to be a Tuesday. We have a regular meeting at the ASC Jim Hester Boardroom, and next is open forum for community input. <clears throat> and 
And we have several open forum requests this evening. Open forum is a time for members of the community to give input at a board meeting regarding school district issues or concerns. Individuals who want to speak should fill out an open forum request and give it to the board secretary prior to open forum. The board will not act on any issue presented dur during open forum if it was not published as an agenda item. The Iowa Open Meetings Law prohibits action on any issue that is not on the agenda. The president will set the amount of time allowed for individuals to speak during open forum. The board asks that no charges or complaints be made against individual employees of the district or community during open forum. Remarks that reflect negatively on the character or motives of any person will be called out of order. The board is appreciative of the community's interests in our deliberation regarding school boundaries and open enrollment. We value input that will allow us to make a thoughtful decision in the educational best interest of our students. However, remarks that reflect negatively upon specific schools or disparage the students and staff assigned to those schools will be called out of order and the speaker will be asked to conclude their remarks immediately. I'll read through the whole list so you have an idea of, uh, of the order here. We'll start with uh, Carrie Peterson, Donia Sariani, Dwayne Bird, Zachary Day, Kelly Gamble, Rachel Dooley, Jeff, Jephtha Yerian, Sally Ellis, Randy Zobrist, Heather Johnson, Rain Nichols. And we'll go in that order. Um, we'll start with Carrie. Carrie, please come up, state your name and address, and all of you will have two minutes. Thank you. My name is Carrie Peterson. I live at 2223 East 46th Street in Davenport. Um, thank you for the opportunity to appeal the decision for my son, Ethan. Um, my husband and I would like to an open enroll him to the Bettendorf School District. Uh, his brother will be attending preschool there in the fall next year. And um, we are very, very concerned with tardiness issues uh, being in two different districts. Um, you know, with being late to school, late being picked up, uh, conflicting with two different school district calendars, early outs, in-service days, um, holidays, everything that goes along with it. And we would like both children to be in the same school district uh, to alleviate our conflicts and concerns with the tardiness. Um, that's all I have. Thank you for your consideration. Okay. Thank you. Next is Donia Seriani. And I apologize if I mispronounced, fine. mispronounced that. Thank you guys for your time. My name is Donia Serini. I have a daughter, Noelle, who is... Oh, I need your address. Sorry. Too. 1533 West Garfield, Davenport. Um, I have a daughter, Noelle, who is going to be enrolling in kindergarten this fall. And my husband and I are hoping to, are looking to open and enroll her um, into the Pleasant Valley School District. We have relocated here from Dearborn, Michigan, and we feel that the Pleasant Valley School District is what's most comparable to the school district that we were previously lived in. We also feel that it would be best suited for our daughter to be there, seeing as we are currently in the process of looking for a home in that school district, and we would hate to have to start a school year in one district and have to transition her into a different school, being that she's a kindergartner and I think change on a five-year-old is not the easiest thing and having to get them adjusted to a new school um, in the middle of a school year. Our lease that we're in now, we're currently renting a home and that ends in October. So we are doing our best to try to get out of the home beforehand, but if that does not happen, we would hate for her to have to transition in the middle of a school year. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Don Donia. Uh, next is Dwayne Bird. Hello, thank you for hearing the appeal. 6002 West 46th Street in Davenport. And I'm just appealing on uh, the behalf of my son, who is hoping to attend Durant High School. 
Um, we have several reasons why it's going to be kind of beneficial for him to be out there. One, my parents are going to be helping to transport him on nights that I get called into work. So he's got relatives out in that area, and it's going to help us out a lot if they can help us get him to school. Um, other than that, everything was in our email on the reasons. I am actually an alumni of Durant, and I love the experience, and I'm looking forward to my son being able to go to school there. Thank you. Thank you, Dwayne. Next is Zachary Day. I'm Zachary Day, live at 6822 Madison Street in Davenport. Um, I'm appealing the open enrollment decision for my daughter Eleanor, who will be going into kindergarten. Uh, I would like her to attend Pleasant View Elementary in Pleasant Valley. Uh, when my wife and I are both teachers, my wife teaches high school in, Dur in uh, Wilton, and I teach elementary school in Pleasant Valley. And I would like my daughter to go to my school, mo ma uh, excuse me, mainly for the reason that logistically with two teachers and adding a third schedule with Davenport is logistically going to be impossible with daycare and other things that um, if my daughter went to my elementary school I could take care of transportation in services are all already taken care of we have family in the district right there she actually has a cousin that's going into kindergarten uh, any early outs she would go directly home with her and it's just when my wife and I picked a, a home to move into, Davenport was the choice because it was equidistant between Pleasant Valley and Wilton. And I would like my daughter to continue her education in Pleasant Valley, um, where I am an alumni as well, and just feel that it is the best opportunity for her. Thank you. Thank you, Zachary. <clears throat> Next is Kelly Gamble. Hi, Kelly Gamble, 2604 West 54th Street. I wrote mine out because I'm nervous, so, <laughs> and I'm emotional. Thank you so much for considering my appeal for my daughter, Madison Gamble, to go to Bettendorf Community Schools. It's important to me that you understand that my need and want for my daughter to go to Bettendorf is due to my wish and need <laughs> for her to continue to attend Christ Family Daycare. When I moved here with my little girl two and a half years ago, our lives had been flipped upside down. My daughter went from having two parents and a stay-at-home mom in Indiana to going to daycare five days a week and an overwhelmed single working mom in Iowa. Um, sorry. When we moved here, we moved to the sleep-in motel on 53rd in Elmore for a little over three weeks while I looked for an apartment and worked. And then we moved to an apartment for six months. I felt very strongly about getting Madison settled in a house, and I tried very hard to thank you to quickly look so she could be in a stable and consistent routine. When I bought my house, I did not understand the lines of the school boundaries or really where the line between Bettendorf and Davenport is really drawn. And to be honest, I'm not quite sure all the time if I'm in Davenport or Bettendorf when we're running around doing errands still. When I found out the details of where we lived versus where Madison's daycare was and would bus to and from, she would go to elementary school. I was, to say the least, a bit devastated. Madison had had some sleeping problems and has had night tears fairly regularly. And although they have lessened in the past few months, her pediatrician has stressed to me that the need to keep her routine as consistent as possible Christ family is part of that consistency. Among all the stress and change that will accompany my daughter and I when she starts kindergarten, I'm sorry, I'm almost done. I would really appreciate if I could keep her before and after school care the same. I would appreciate it if you would vote to open enroll my daughter, Madison, in Bettendorf so that she may remain at Christ family daycare in a consistent and loving environment. Thanks, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. And that's, you don't need to apologize. We appreciate you being here. Next is Rachel Dooley. Hi, 
thank you. My name is Rachel Dooley. I live at 335 Forest Road in Davenport. Um, my husband and I are requesting that our daughter Mason be allowed to open enroll in Bettendorf schools. Um, we are right on the border of Davenport and Bettendorf and uh, Mark Twain Elementary um, is extremely close to us, um, but more importantly, close to my mother who we use for a childcare provider. A neighbor across the street from her is our backup childcare provider. <clears throat> my husband um, and I both work full time. He is uh, consistently at work until five. My job, however, is extremely unpredictable and sometimes I don't know what I'm doing um, in the after school times. Um, I work with teenagers and um, my, my day usually doesn't really begin until right when school ends. So it's really um, a conflict with my job. I wanna make sure that my daughter entering kindergarten, um, that there's proper supervision for her um, walking from school and also um, you know, being at home after school. That's not an issue at all if she can attend Bettendorf. She is within walking distance uh, to my mother's house at the elementary school and also the middle school. Um, so this isn't something that we would have to worry about for uh, many, many years. Um, the other thing is, uh, this is kind of a recent concern, but um, there is a, a dog in the neighborhood that has attacked other dogs going by. It's 99 pounds uh, face level. <laughs> now I'm getting emotional <laughs> with my daughter. And uh, I just don't want there to be any unsupervised time. We just found out the dog is going to be staying in the neighborhood and um, it breaks its um, chain and it's uh, a little dangerous. So um, our issues um, are really taken care of. If she can go to Bettendorf, there's 100% supervision um, on a daily basis. My husband attended uh, McKinley and Sudlow had great experiences. I attended Bettendorf, had wonderful experiences. So. Um, really just a supervision issue. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Next is Jeff the Yerian. Hello, my name is Jeff the Yerian, 1830 West 36th Street, Davenport. I am a junior at West High School, and I'm not here to talk about uh, the school boundaries, but about the parking lot. Uh, it's not really that safe considering the lines are hard to see and there's just a lot of students there. Last year there was an accident that was very serious where a car was flipped. Um, it was just, you know, it's very dangerous and I think one way that would be able to help protect that is not only painting new lines that are easier to see, but also adding in speed bumps that will force drivers to drive slower. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jeff. Jeff, the, am I pronouncing that correct? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Next is Sally Ellis. Sally Ellis, 2216 North Nevada, Davenport. Uh, retired head custodian, 33 and a half years. Uh, this is surprisingly not going to be an installment of uh, outsourcing. I'm going to say that. I hope I don't have to uh, have any more. But I just wanted to come up for a minute and tell you all thank you very much for your patience with me and listening to uh, the things that I have to say. And I really appreciate it. You have a lot of difficult decisions to make. And uh, I'm hoping that one of them isn't outsourcing. Uh, I have a lot of stories I could tell after 33 and a half years, so there could be some more installments if I have to. But I did beat the timer last time, so I'm really proud of that, although I did talk way too fast. Thank you very much for all of your listening. Thank you, too. Thank you, Sally. Next is Randy Zobrist. Good evening, Randy Zobrist. I live at 3505 Wisconsin Avenue in Davenport. Uh, I'm also the executive director of Riverbend Transit. 
I want to thank you for the opportunity to address uh, the board regarding um, this important matter. I'm here to request the board's reconsideration of the recommendation to award a contract for transportation service for early childhood students and students with disabilities, which is your agenda item 6F. Despite the administration staff's response to the school board regarding this matter, and I believe you all had a, a copy of that, I believe there still exist serious questions about ambiguous, uh, excuse me, ambiguous uh, criteria in the RFP which had an impact on an accurate evaluation of the two proposals. I offer two examples for the board to consider tonight. The staff response states that the RFP was very clear in asking for a proposal for 200 students. And we discussed this a couple weeks ago. The 13 page RFP only noted a single sentence and that single sentence says, currently we have approximately 200 students requiring these services. <clears throat> In the 13 page RFP, that's, that's the only time that that number is ever mentioned. No other reference to 200 students was noted in the RFP. If the RFP was very clear, then why did the staff have to contact both bidders to determine how many students they bid on? According to staff, the other bidder's proposal didn't even identify how many students it was bidding on. The issue to consider is the RFP did not ask for the number of students the bids were to be based on, only the mention of the current number of students requiring service. Example number two, the RFP did not identify any school calendar. Did both bidders bid on the same school calendar? Obviously, there would be a significant cost difference depending on a nine or a 12 month calendar. The question that I'd like you to consider, what common school calendar should have been identified in the RFP and used by both bidders? I do not believe the district has received the most accurate proposals from either bidder based on these poorly defined criteria. Riverbend Transit respectfully requests that the board reject both RFP responses and issue a new RFP with a more clearly defined scope of services including the intended number of students to be served and a proposed 2013-14 calendar. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. <clears throat> Next is Heather Johnson. Hello, Heather Johnson, 505 West 16th Street in Davenport, and I've come to talk to you about the boundaries again. Um, I wanted to say I know that you've been very tied up with the budget and I know that's an ongoing thing but I just want to point out you know I've been to every single one of these meetings since December I've been to every single public forum since that you've had since December and it's almost May so this has been going on a really long time and there are only there's only one month essentially left in school so how are you you know when is the decision going to be made and how are people going to be notified it's the time frame has gotten so short i understand you've been tied up with other things but you know um, there are real issues of overcrowding that needed to be addressed but now there's one proposed plan that's out there and i've heard you talk at several meetings about changes you've made to those plans affecting some neighborhoods moving some out of some schools that were in the proposed plan and into other ones and those families have missed all opportunities for public input all the public forums were held and they thought they were unaffected i think in, 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 the plan is so different now or could be so different now than what was discussed at those public forums I don't know how valid that public input is any longer and I think you know it's the time has come to either make a decision or decide you're not going to do it this year I think it warrants more study I think the maps that you've gotten are poor and could bear some better interpretation there's more that you can do to take into account um, diversity on the income levels and the ethnicity to ensure that we're not concentrating poverty but time is running out so if you're going to do it this year it kind of needs to be really really soon because it's going to affect people and you're going to hear a big screaming outcry from all of the people who were thought they were in the clear and now are not because the boundaries have shifted yet again so you know I think it's just it's gone on a long time I know it's exhausting for you I'm not even employed by the school district and it's exhausting for me to keep track of all of these meetings think of all the families who aren't informed and that are going to find out when they go to register their kids their schools have changed and it, the time has run out I mean there's less than a month left so that's what I wanted to say thank you Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Heather. Next is Rain Nichols. Rain Nichols, 310 South A Street. Um, I just thought I'd bring to uh, the topic of open enrollment. 
Um, I'm a junior at Davenport West, and I often see students not eating lunch. And I think that open enrollment would offer um, more options for the students instead of not eating, and that would just be more beneficial to the student body. And that's it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Rain. And thanks to all of you for <coughs> expressing your um, advocacy and your positions on the various issues. We'll move on to the consent agenda. May I have a motion? Mr. President. Director Crumody. I move the consent agenda as presented by the administration. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Directors of, or Director DeFau. Um I'd be remiss tonight if I didn't take a moment um, and make note of the resignation of Helen Brennan from North High School. Um, she has been the drama teacher at North uh, for more than 10 years, and the program has certainly flourished under her tenure there. Um, in the last 10 years, the North drama program has been invited to perform at the International Thespian Festival in Lincoln, Nebraska on three occasions in 2007, 2011, and they will again be performing this summer in 2013. Um, they've also performed at the American High School Theater Festival in Edinburgh, Scotland, which only 50 schools nationwide are invited to participate in, and they've been again nominated to perform there next summer as well. Uh, we've had Allstate Thespians during her tenure, and each year since she's been a staff member, we have had uh, student uh, state board members as well, so they're learning leadership in the uh, Iowa State Thespian uh, Committee as well. So uh, the program's going to truly miss her and her leadership, and I think we're all struggling with how things will remain the same, so she will be missed. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there any additional discussion? We'll call for the vote. Director Crumwitty? Yes. Director Zamora? Yes. Director DeFau? Yes. Director Cluel? Yes. Director Sherwood? Yes. Director Robertson? Yes. My vote is yes. Motion carries. <coughs> May I have a motion regarding approval of bills? Mr. President? Director Cluel? I move that the board approve the following resolution for the adoption of bills. Resolved all claims presented to the board, having been duly certified as correct by the secretary, reviewed by the administration and board members, and they are hereby audited and allowed as just claims and warrants drawn in the treasury for the several amounts. Further resolved, the payment of claims and salaries be approved as presented for the periods April 4, 2013 through April 17, 2013, with the following voided checks. Check number 305742, payable to Davenport Train in the amount of $4,591.47, that being to the wrong vendor. And secondly, check number 305616, payable to Western Dubuque Community Schools in the amount of $75, and that event was canceled. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? We'll call for the vote. <coughs> Director Cluel? Yes. Director Zamora? Yes. Director Robertson? Yes. Director DeFau? Yes. Director Sherwood? Yes. Director Crumwitty? Yes. My vote is yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Superintendent report. Superintendent Tate. Thank you, Mr. President. Before turning to our student representatives, I'd like to announce that Daphne Cornish, an 18-year-old senior at Central High School and the daughter of Mark and Julie Cornish of Davenport, has been selected to receive the prestigious Dr. Thomas A. Dooley Award Scholarship for 2013. The scholarship has been awarded each year since 1965 to a Davenport High School student whose academic rank is in the upper 10 percent of their class, has shown a continued interest in the field of medicine, and plans to become a doctor. Ms. Cornish plans to attend Washington University in St. Louis to pursue a major in biology with a minor in environmental science. And students? I guess I'll start us off. Um, let's see here. At Central, um, we just finished up our variety show. Um, a lot of great acts going on there. A lot of a bit of a challenge getting them all on 
Kaler's stage, but we shouldn't have that problem in years to come. Um, let's see here. Uh, JROTC is getting ready for um, a, what's called a Raider competition. It's an adventure train competition. We have teams come in from, oh gosh, Wisconsin, Illinois, um, Missouri, and they come in and they compete. They do 10K road marches, a PT test, um, a lot of Army type stuff. And we'll be doing that over at the Arsenal. And the cadets are actually the, the planners and the people who execute that. Our instructors just kind of sit by and, you know, give us a little guidance when we need it. But they're the ones that put it together. Uh, the band's still getting ready to go up to the Iowa Band Association to perform there. Uh, big honor for us, and we've been putting in a lot of work for that. So. All right. Um, at North, we this. Oh, jeez. It was either this past no, it was two weekends ago. See, I'm getting mixed up. We went to a small group contest for vocals, and um, all our ensembles got Division One ratings, and the women's ensemble got best in center, which means we get to go to Ames, Iowa, and perform for them, which is like a really high honor. And we also just got done with our talent show it's called Follies and we raised fifteen hundred dollars for our program and uh, a, I forgot um, Jacob Warner a celloist at North also got best in center so he's gonna go up to Ames with us he's really awesome and um, proms coming up really excited so yeah um, at West, last week we had our blood drive, which was another good turnout, like it always is. Um, we have our fourth term art show, so you can come to our library from 7.30 to 3.30 and check that out. And um, we have prom coming up, and today we have Mr. Ox, government class from West, observing. And, yeah. What day is the art show called? Uh, you can come any day. It's till, I think, May 4th. Yeah. And it's just... In our library, yeah, till May fourth. Thank you very much, Mr. President. This concludes our briefing. Thank you very much, student board members and Superintendent Tate. We'll move on to other items requiring action. We have a motion on the plans and specifications for district-wide intruder locks. Mr. President. Director Robertson. I move that we accept the administrative recommendation and improve the plan and specification as presented for district-wide intruder locks. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. <clears throat> we will now hold a public hearing on the proposed project as published in the Quad City Times on Friday, April 12, 2013. Anyone wishing to speak on this project, please step forward to the microphone, state your name and address for the record. Seeing and hearing none, I now declare the public hearing closed. Is there any additional discussion on this matter? All right, we'll call for the vote. Director Robertson? Yes. Director Crumwitty? Yes. Director DeFowl? Yes. Director Cluel? Yes. Director Zamora? Yes. Director Sherwood? Yes. My vote is yes. Motion carries. We have a motion regarding fresh fruits and vegetables individually packaged. Mr. President. Director Cluel. I move that the board approve the proposal of $180,000 from Lafredo Fresh Produce Company for procurement of single serve individually packaged fresh fruits and vegetables as their proposal meets all the required terms and conditions at an acceptable fair market price. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Director Cluel. Is the entire amount of that, all of the money going towards this particular uh, procurement is grant money then, is that correct? Mickey Carrington. Yes, that is correct. This um, grant we have is a federal grant for the fresh fruit and vegetable program and all the funds for, for this come out of that grant money. And, and you all went to the trouble to get this to a number of bidders, but only <coughs> one uh, bidder returned their bid. Uh, 
Can you surmise why that would be? Um, yes, because when we, we serve these to all but four of the elementary classrooms to every student in the building, so on a daily basis we need 6,000 individual packets of fruits and vegetables. The only people that can do it are the people that have the manufacturing um, facilities to do it, which is the only one in the area is Lafredo. It absolutely has to be single serve. There's no way that you could deal with this in bulk. We used to do it in bulk. Um, and then our staff would process it, which was very expensive labor-wise, because they did it all by hand and put it in Ziploc bags and zipped them all closed. Because the students sit in the classroom and eat the snack, and um, teachers don't have the time to prepare it or cut it to give it out, and it needs refrigeration. So it is easiest to do it in an individually bagged process. Well, I, I think thanks are in order to Senator Harkin, I think, who got this bill going, if I'm not mistaken, and it means a lot to our kids at school. Yeah, they love it. Yeah. <clears throat> Director Sherwood. Yeah, I, I anytime I see something uh, prepackaged going toward kids, I'm always uh, reminded of all the E. coli scares and all that kind of stuff. What kind of due diligence have we done to look at the track record of this manufacturer to know that we're dealing with an entity that is uh, above reproach? Um, the, they have a, we require that they have a certificate of HACCP, which is Hazardous Analysis Critical Control Point, and they have actually ISO 2000 um, manufacturing compliance, and they package for restaurants all over a 400-mile area here in the state of Iowa. Have we, and, look, have we looked for, uh, whether it be Agriculture Department or whoever it would be, uh, any, uh, any fines or, or uh, uh, issues with this company? Uh, yes, we yeah. do that when we put it out for bid, and we require that they give us a compliance statement when they bid. Okay. And how do we monitor the quality? Um, generally, all of our managers that receive the product would let me know if there's any, any concerns with the product. Um, we also require that they come in refrigerated trucks and they have a shelf life of seven days. So there's multiple things that we have in place in addition to what the manufacturer and the manufacturing environment does for food safety. Good. Thank you. Any additional discussion? <clears throat> we'll call for the vote. Director Cluel? Yes. Director Zamora? Yes. Director Sherwood? Yes. Director Crumwitty? Yes. Director Robertson? Yes. Director DeFowle? Yes. My vote is yes. Motion carries. Thank you. May I have a motion regarding approval of bid partial re-roofing project at Sudlow? <coughs> Mr. President? Director I, Sherwood? I move that the board uh, accept the recommendation uh, of the uh, lowest uh, responsible responsive bid received from Gessler Brothers Company in the amount of $120,969 for the partial re-roofing project at Sudlow Intermediate School. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? We'll call for the vote. Director Sherwood? Yes. Director Cluel? Yes. Director Zamora? Yes. Director Crumwitty? Yes. Director Robertson? Yes. Director DeFowle? Yes. My vote is yes. Motion carries. <clears throat> May I have a motion regarding approval of bid for partial re-roofing project at JB? Mr. President. Director Robertson. JB, uh, I move that we uh, accept the administration's recommendation and approve the lowest responsible responsive bid received from Black Hawk Roof Company in the amount of $20,800 for the partial re-roofing project at JB Young Intermediate. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. second. Is there any discussion? <clears throat> we'll call for the vote. Director Robertson? Yes. Director Zamora? Yes. Director Cluel? Yes. Director Sherwood? Yes. Director Crumwitty? Yes. Director DeFowle? Yes. My vote is yes. Motion carries. May I have a motion regarding approval of bid for the North High School Cafeteria Air Conditioning Project? Mr. President. Director Robertson? I move that we accept the administration recommendation and approve the lowest responsible responsive bid received from Air Control Inc. in the amount of 389000 for the North High School Cafeteria Air Conditioning Project. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Call for the vote. Director Robertson? Yes. Director DeFowle? Yes. Director Cluel? Yes. 
Director Zamora? Yes. Director Sherwood? Yes. Director Crumwitty? Yes. My vote is yes. Motion carries. <clears throat> May I have a motion regarding Early Childhood Transportation Award? Mr. President. Director Crumwitty. I move the administration's recommendation approval of Durham School Services to provide early childhood transportation for the 2013-14 school year in the amount of $586,927. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Yes. Director Zamora. Well, I have a concern. Obviously, this proposal has caused some confusion and stress, but there's a line in there that bothers me. It says, we are intending to provide additional services to students in the 2013-14 year attending the four-year-old program. Why are we cutting busing on one hand and adding students on the other hand? We have um, money from the state for the four-year four -year old voluntary preschool program, and those were funds that we were intending to use so that we could get services to more four-year-old students for the 2013-14 um, school year. Okay, thank you. Additional discussion, Director Sherwood. Yeah, I, I read uh, uh, the administration's responses, and I understand what they're saying, uh, although I hear a uh, man stand here who has uh, uh, been a good uh, uh, provider, supplier in the past, and I think there's still some confusion on these parts, and I, and I don't want folks to go away thinking that they've been treated unfairly uh, or have an issue that uh, hasn't been resolved. Uh, so I would... Uh, I don't know if I make a motion, but I would move that we reject these two bids and rebid this unless uh, Dr. Tate has a compelling reason that might uh, interfere with the uh, operation of the, of the district. <clears throat> Superintendent Tate, would you want to respond to that before I consider amending the motion? If you don't vote tonight, what I would suggest is that we get some legal advice because we could have the other company who is being recommended suggest that there's a foul also, so if you say we want more information, we'd like to see about going out to rebid. I'd need to. I want legal advice to make sure that's what we should do. <clears throat> uh, Director Sherwood, you kind of suggested a a proposal. You said you wanted to reject both bids. Is that what I heard? Yeah, that's what you heard, but I, I, you know, with the proviso that we I listened to, to Dr. Tate, I guess what I'd like to see us do is to see what our options are, uh, and, and if we, if practical, to reject these bids and rebid it, uh, I'd like to do that because I don't want anybody thinking that they weren't treated fairly on this thing, and uh, and I think some of these issues that are raised are, um, uh, you know, if they if they believe those to be true, and I have no reason why they wouldn't they wouldn't think that then I don't want them to feel like they've been mistreated. <clears throat> I'm not sure exactly how we would do that um, in, in, in the context of what we have to do. Rejecting both bids, I think, would... I guess I'd move the table, then. That's what I, what moving I the do. table would be something totally different. Right. So I, I, I haven't made a motion yet. So I, my, my thinking is that I, I guess that moving the table until we found out more information about our ability to do that uh, would be uh, what I would suggest. Oh, boy. <clears throat> and I'm going to test my parliamentary procedure here a little bit. Um, moving to table, I'm going to say requires an immediate vote. Um, and I, I'm going to say that, but I'm going to allow discussion on the motion to table. You also Bef need a second. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. So, <clears throat> so in this case, I'm going to ask for a second. I'm going to allow discussion on the motion, and then we will vote on the motion to <laughs> table. Is, is there a second to the motion to table the vote? Yes, I second it. All right, is there any discussion on this motion? The, and the motion on the table is to table the vote. Director DeFowle. There's been concern expressed that there was ambiguity in the language of the RFP and that it wasn't clearly 
enumerated that we would in fact be providing busing services for 200 students, which was reflected with the four-year-old preschool program increase. Can you speak to that, please? Um, as I stated in the memo that we did have in there that said, currently we have approximately 200 students requiring these services. Um, we did confirm to make sure that we had um, equal proposals with Durham that it was 200 students. We contacted Mr. Zobrist and he had submitted his proposal on 100. We then asked him if he would please submit a proposal on 200 so that we knew that we had equal proposals going forward. Um, I will also say that both vendors had an opportunity to call us with questions if they had any. Um, we did have several questions from Durham. We did not hear from Mr. Zobrist that there was any um, concerns or problems with the RFP at that time. Would it be common practice to include a copy of the school year calendar in an RFP? Um, it depends. Um, since Riverbend Transit had been providing the services in the past, um, they knew that we were running a year-round calendar. That was one of the questions that Durham had. Um, they submitted their proposal on a year-round, but wanted to confirm that that is what we were requesting. But it wasn't specified in the RFP that it was a year-round? I, I have a copy of their RFP, but I haven't had a chance to go back and look at it. I think that would be an important piece of information to know. Any additional discussion? Director Crumbody. If we do table this, and a suggestion was made that we get legal a legal opinion, will that be done um, between now and the time this issue comes back to us? Certainly. Is there any additional discussion? Director Kluhl. Last board meeting, the board um, asked that this particular motion be withdrawn or postponed and uh, I, I appreciate the fact that administration has done what I believe is due diligence uh, to contact both bidders. Um, I believe that administration has done the right thing and I am ready to vote on this issue. Any additional discussion? And we're going to vote on the, the first motion that is on the table is to uh, table the original motion, which is to accept the administration recommendation uh, for approval of Durham School Services. I'm going to call for the vote to table. Director Sherwood? Yes. Director Zamora? Yes. Director Robertson? No. Director DeFau? Yes. Yes. Director Cluel? No. Director Cromedy? Yes. My vote is no. The motion carries and uh, the original motion then to accept the administration recommendation for the approval of Durham School Services to provide early childhood transportation has been tabled. Thank you. May I have a motion regarding open enrollment denial appeals? Mr. President. Director Zamora. I move that we accept the administration's recommendation and uphold the superintendent's decision to deny open enrollment between districts based on the district's diversity plan and board policy 502.16, open enrollment between districts for the following students who have appealed. Uh, do you want me to read all their names? Yes, please. Okay. Reese Bird, ninth grade, Durant, requested uh, Durant High School. Eleanor Day, kindergarten, Pleasant Valley, Pleasant View. Mason Dooley, Kindergarten, Bettendorf, Mark Twain. Madison Gamble, Kindergarten, Bettendorf, Hoover or Paul Norton. Oliver Kramer, Kindergarten, Pleasant Valley, Riverdale Heights. Leah Mason, Kindergarten, Clayton Ridge, Iowa Virtual Academy. Ethan Peterson, Kindergarten, Bettendorf, Hoover or Paul Norton. Nawali Al Serini, Kindergarten, sorry if I did that wrong. Kindergarten, Pleasant Valley, Riverdale. Marlon Stewart, 11th grade, North Scott. No choice of school. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. 
Second. Is there any discussion? Director DeFau. Could director, director, could Dr. Tate explain the process by which these open enrollment applications were denied? <coughs> the process is based on our diversity plan, which indicates that um, approval of requests for people to leave our district to go to another district will be approved at the same ratio of what we call B to A students. All of our students in the district are qualified as A, being that they might, if they're free and reduced lunch or they have not passed the Iowa assessment with a meets or exceeds and they're considered to be an A student, all the others are Bs. And the diversity plan allows us to uh, restrict those going out to other districts based on that ratio. The ratio for this year is 1.8 to 1. So um, we look at all the A students going out, and then we approve those, and then we approve a ratio of 1.8 to the number uh, going out of the A students. And we always have more B students than we do um, slots. We have a lottery. Uh, they pick the names out of the hat, and then it's the luck of the draw. And this number, in fact, is not representative of the total group that was denied, but represents the number of families that appealed. Who appealed, yes. Okay. Director Zamora. Yeah, it always makes me sad to see that the majority of people requesting out are people who never went in our schools, uh, pre-kindergartners who aren't even interested in seeing how really wonderful we are. Additional discussion, Director Sherwood. Um, yes. Uh, Dr. Tate, could you uh, outline to me how we document the receipt of, uh, of these uh, forms and acknowledge our receipt to the senders? Right now, we don't have a good system for doing that. What we do is just depend on either the email, mail, or fax to receive those. Uh, this year, for the first time, we had three families who indicated that um, they had not heard from us and we had indicated to them we had not received their applications uh, because they certainly seemed um, as though they were genuine and we thought that we had done everything to receive them. In that case, I took those three families and I held a second lottery. I looked at the percent of B applicants that were chosen from the first lottery and it was one out of four. And of the three families we had in the second lottery, I let them pick one, so it was one out of three, a little bit better odds. And so we ran a second lottery. Next year, we're going to do it differently. People have to bring it to our office. We have to give them a receipt. We need to see people. We need the paperwork. It's fair to us, fair to them to make sure we don't have this again. Thank you. Director Kluhl. Dr. Tate referenced the policy that the board approved um, 502.16 on open enrollment. It's a policy that the board approved uh, for the benefit of 16,000 kids in the Davenport Community School District. And I, I just, I, I have to say thank you to those parents who advocated tonight on behalf of their children and the board does not discount your rationale. They're all good reasons. But again, on behalf of 16,000 students, the board has decided that the best policy is to have this open enrollment policy in place. Additional discussion. I have one question, <clears throat> and it may have been addressed uh, by Director Sherwood's question on the process, um, but I'm looking specifically at the appeal from Kelly Gamble that seems to talk about um, the process and is that one of them that you talked about that came up in this second process I need to check and see um, not one that's that's not one of the three okay so we're not sure is there a way could somebody address the the concerns that were expressed here um, it when I read through it, <coughs> there were, it seemed like there were process questions. I just wanted to make sure that we followed our process properly. Uh, 
this is the one that was faxed. And if I remember, uh, Mr. Snaden, the fax was one of the three. There were two emails and one fax. So this is one that uh, because, you know, we didn't have a receipt of it and they said that they had a receipt of sending it, that I would be fair to run a second lottery. So I did, in fact, put three families in a second lottery. We picked one third of those, which was a, a better odds in the, the first time around. Okay, so so they did at least go through the process, even though it was a second part of the process. Okay, thank you. Any additional discussion? We'll call for the vote. Director Zamora. Yes. Director Cluel. Yes. Director Crumwitty. Yes. Director Robertson. Yes. Director DeFau. Yes. Director Sherwood. Yes. And my vote is yes. I have a motion regarding paraeducator contract approval. Mr. President. Director Robertson. Before I get started, the one thing I want to say to Ty and all the people that were involved in this process, uh, it was the most professional uh, discussion that I have been a part in, and I have been a part of negotiation for quite some time. And I just wanted to show my appreciation because we had great discussion without it being personal. So again, I just want to say to all of the group, not just this one but group, that thank you for your professionalism. Thank you, Director Robertson. I move that we accept the administration recommendation and approve the terms of the two-year negotiated paraeducator contract for paraeducators with the Davenport Community School District for 2013-2015. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Second. Is there any discussion? Director Sherwood. Yeah, Mr. President, I, I said when I first week I was on the board, and I want to restate it now, that our lower uh, wage employees, uh, when we look at uh, uh, percentage increases uh, year by year, they, they t continue to fall further behind uh, our upper echelon employees. And I think we need to have a determined effort to uh, try to give uh, more money to those uh, folks that are so close to uh, uh, to minimum wage that it's embarrassing. Uh, uh, we uh, we have to do a better job of treating those folks, uh, uh, getting them closer to a living wage. We just don't, you know, we're not there yet. Is there any additional discussion? Call for the vote. Director Robertson? Yes. Director Cluel? Yes. Director Sherwood? Yes. Director Crumwitty? Yes. Director DeFau? Yes. Director Zamora? Yes. My vote is yes. Motion carries. May I have a motion regarding secretarial contract approval? Mr. President. Director Robertson. If there are any secretaries here, I certainly want to convey that same appreciation for the representation because it was absolutely very, very good in terms of conversation and dialogue. So with that, I move that we uh, approve the administration's recommendation of a two-year negotiated secretarial contract for secretary with the Davenport Community School District for 2013-2015. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Call for the vote. Director Robertson? Yes. Director <coughs> Cluel? Yes. Director Zamora? Yes. Director Sherwood? Yes. Director Crumwitty? Yes. Director DeFau? Yes. My vote is yes. Motion carries. May I have a motion regarding food and nutrition service contract approval? Mr. President. Director Robertson. Here again, the Food and Nutritional Service Representative, I want to say if there are any in the House, I certainly appreciate your dialogue and your input into the contract negotiation. With that, I move that we accept the Administrator's recommendation and approve the two-year negotiated contract for Food and Nutritional Service with the Downport Community School District for 2013-2015. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Call for the vote. Director Robertson. Yes. Director Crumwitty. Yes. Director Cluel. Yes. Director Zamora. Yes. Director Sherwood. Yes. Director DeFau. Yes. My vote is yes. Motion carries. <clears throat> May I have a motion regarding custodial contract approval? Mr. President. Director Robertson. First of all, I'd like to say to the custodial group, uh, your representation, I certainly appreciate it. Your dialogue, your input, your professionalism. And uh, I'm say that I am pleased to have been a part of that negotiation process. 
With that, I move that we accept the administration's recommendation and approve the terms of a two-year negotiated contract for the custodial warehouse security and copy selling employees with the Davenport Community School District for 2013-2015. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Call for the vote. Director Robertson? Yes. Director Crumwitty? Yes. Director DeFile? Yes. Director Cluel? Yes. Director Zamora? Yes. Director Sherwood? Yes. And my vote is yes. Motion carries. I have a motion regarding the resolution for the public hearing for Goose Hollow. Mr. President? Director Cluel? I move that the board approve the following resolution. Whereas Davenport Community School District is the owner of certain real estate located in Davenport, Iowa, more particularly described on Exhibit A attached here too, and whereas Davenport Community School District desires to transfer said property without consideration to the city of Davenport, and whereas Davenport Community School District is required to hold a public hearing on the proposed transfer pursuant to Iowa Code Section 297.22, resolved that a public hearing shall be held in the third floor Jim Hester board room of the Davenport Schools Achievement Center at 1606 Brady Street, Davenport, Iowa on May 13, 2013 at 7 p.m. for the purpose of considering the transfer of real estate owned by the school district to the city of Davenport. For the resolve that the secretary shall publish notice of transfer of real estate and notice of public hearing in the Quad City Times at least once, not less than 10 days but not more than 20 days prior to the date of the public hearing. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Director Sherwood. Just, just a point. I, I can't imagine any reason to retain this land. I mean, I know the property and, and its past history, but have we run this by the staff at, at Central High School? Have they had an opportunity to, to think about this uh, move? Yeah, there would not be any purpose for them to to utilize that property. I can't imagine one either, but just they have been notified and yeah. all that. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Any additional discussion? Call for the vote. Director Cluel? Yes. Director Zamora? Yes. Director Robertson? Yes. Director DeFau? Yes. <coughs> Director Sherwood? Yes. Director Crumwitty? Yes. And my vote is yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Move into discussion items. First discussion item, Superintendent Tate on bonding. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Marsha, are you going to? or? I've asked uh, Jenny Blankenship from PFM um, to be here tonight to answer any questions that you have. You should have received copies in your board packets of three different scenarios um, for bonding. <coughs> Um, and what the um, cost would be if we would bond versus um, letting construction inflation um, take place. And uh, we presented a, a, a great deal of information um, for you for your consideration. And Jenny is here to answer any questions you have or um, for any additional information that you would like on the bonding scenarios. Thanks, Marcia. Uh, Jenny Blankenship with Public Financial Management, or PFM, 801 Grand Avenue, Des Moines, Iowa. And um, we have worked with the school district for many years on uh, running different scenarios, um, some bond issues in the past. It has been several years since the district has issued uh, any debt. Um, but we wanted to go ahead uh, and run some scenarios regarding your local option sales tax, your statewide penny, save, silo, they change the name about every year. So what we have here and what I've provided uh, the board with is three different scenarios. The first scenario is uh, the cash flow with all of the projects laid out in your CIP plan as it was given to us, which I believe has 1.5% inflationary adjustments every year throughout the, throughout the life of when that project is gonna be completed. So what you'll see on each of these cash flows, um, just to explain kind of how the numbers flow, because there's a lot of numbers in here, um, we start off with the revenues, uh, which is going to be your statewide penny uh, receipts that come in monthly. 
We've then built in um, any other other income that there is, interest income, um, any any other adjustments like that, and then we've made an estimate going forward of interest income, uh, and that is based off 25 basis points or 0.25 percent. And then you can see here we get down to the expenditures, and you can see that in the past, back in 1999 through 2002, there were some uh, outstanding local option sales tax bonds. In 2010, those were all paid off, and so therefore there is currently no debt outstanding that needs to be paid. If you flip the page then, we get to some other expenditures that we're showing being paid out of this fund each year. Um, There's some personnel, some professional fees, as well as supplies. So we are uh, still showing that that's happening out throughout the future, throughout the life of the, of the um, local option sales tax monies coming in through 2029. And then on line 48 on this sheet, um, there's little numbers to the left, and on line 48 is the capital outlay line. And I think this is the most important line to look at tonight in order for you guys to uh, look at your decisions here. Um, and what this is, is this is essentially all of the detail, um, the, the second half of this page down as well as the next page. This is all the detail down below. It adds up and is pulled into line 48 up here. So you can see in FY13, based off your uh, CIP plan, you're looking at $12,975,000 worth of projects. Uh, in 14, 17.5, and 15, 12.2 and 16, 12.3 and 17, 12.4 and 18, and then there is the second part of the cash flow that goes out FY19 through 29. So that's as is. And you can see here, if you look at line 57 then on that same page, this shows what's gonna happen to your unrestricted cash or the cash that you have in the fund to, make, uh, to pay for all of these needs. Um, as you can see, you ha still have a, a strong cash balance, so you're able to pay for all of these projects from the cash that you have on hand, okay? So I think that's something to keep in mind. Uh, you can get all of these projects done whether or not you bond. Then we started looking at scenarios of how much could we save in construction cost by taking out that inflationary adjustment by moving those projects up and being able to get those projects done sooner. Okay, so exhibit one tells you just as is uh, based off of the CIP plan right now. Version two, you'll see, and the versions are written at the bottom. It's not very clear, but um, you can see version two. This assumes that we sell approximately $20 million worth of bonds. Okay, by doing that, what we're able to do is we're able to move up projects and get them done sooner than we could just by not issuing bonds. And by doing so, um, there is a savings of, of about $3.4 million um, of total construction savings. And then we need to net off what it's gonna cost for you to borrow to see if there still is a positive savings um, when you're looking at borrowing. So by moving up the projects, we can now get projects that we're gonna go through 2019 previously. We can get all the projects up. Um, we significantly increase, if you look at those um, in FY14 and, and 15, um, that's where you're seeing the significant amount of projects being moved up and done faster. The reason why we're not showing more being done in 14 is we're not sure if that can really get done. Um, uh, so that's why we think by planning, we might really be able to talk with the engineers, your construction folks, to make sure it gets done in 15. If in discussion, we think that we could get more projects done in 14 than we're showing, we definitely have the capacity to do so. And in doing that, you're going to see more savings. Um, so that's just something I wanted to point out that, you know, we, we moved it up based off your priority on your CIP. However, we would need some additional information from your construction folks to see, even if we move it up in our cash flow, can it really get done? Are there people to really do the projects? Um, but in doing this, like I said, you're saving about $3.4 million worth of um, inflationary costs on these projects. And essentially what that would mean is you would go out into the bond market 
and on this scenario, we're assuming $20 million worth of bonds, which is also about the same amount as the central auditorium and pool, roughly. I mean, if you're just looking at a couple projects to try to uh, a target on this, but it, it could be whatever projects you want um, to make up that $20 million. Now, as you guys are all aware, when you go out to issue bonds, there's a cost associated with that. And so if um, you take into consideration the interest costs that you're going to have to pay, because even though their interest is very low right now, there still is interest on, on going out and borrowing money. In addition, there's an underwriter's discount, which is the cost for um, the underwriters or the people that would purchase these bonds. Um, it's a normal customary um, expense that they would keep. And that's what, how they get paid to go out and market these bonds to any of the purchasers. And then there's other costs of issuance, such as the financial advisor cost of issuance, bond council cost of issuance, um, to get the official statement printed, um, any trustee costs that you may or may not have, other miscellaneous type costs that are, are related to issuing bonds. Okay? So if I look at the total savings, of the construction fund, that's about $3,432,000. If I back off the interest costs, which are about $1.3 million, the underwriter's discount of about $80,000, and other miscellaneous cost of issuance of about $75,000, you're still looking at total savings of about $1.9 million, even after you're borrowing. Okay, that would be the net savings that you would see. And one of the reasons um, for that is that um, we were able to move up so many projects that would have to get pushed out further, and the cost of borrowing at this time in today's market just isn't very high. So by uh, moving those projects up, you're still having a positive effect, even if you would want to borrow, even after paying the cost of the borrowing. One thing to keep in mind, too, is um, I know we ran these scenarios last year for you on a $30 million bond issue, um, for those of you that uh, were, were familiar with that. The one thing to keep in mind is the Davenport School District has a revenue purpose statement that expires in 2019. Uh, you cannot issue bonds without that revenue purpose statement. And because this expires in 2019, we could only issue bonds out on the market through 2019 because you have to match up your borrowing with um, that revenue purpose statement that has been voted on. So we're only looking at um, about a five-year bond issue here. So we're able to get $20 million of, of proceeds today that we could get projects done by 2015, and we're just going to pay that over, to, over the next five years so your borrowing cost is, is a, a low in comparison to that. So that's why you're still going to be able to see savings um, when normally, you know, you would think you're going to borrow money, you're only going to see additional costs. So that's what I want to keep in mind with the $20 million bond issue. Now, version 3 assumes we could sell $30 million, which is essentially the max um, that we think you could sell in bonds right now, still keep your cash positive, and move projects up as you, as you can. Um, unfortunately, when we ran this scenario last year, we assumed that there would be able to be an FY14 principal payment. Because we've now pushed things back um, and, and the process didn't get started like, it, like when we originally ran those scenarios, some of the timing issues have changed. So instead of having a six-year bond issue, it's still back to that five years. So you can't get quite as, it's not quite as beneficial on the cost savings as it was previously. So what we have found with the $30 million bond issue the project cost savings would be about $4,097,000 versus that 3.4 that I mentioned earlier. So we're not getting a lot for that t additional $10 million of projects. We're not getting a lot of additional savings on the construction side of things because we've already moved up everything we can into FY15. So it's only getting moved up like one or two years versus possibly three. Okay, so we're just not getting as much bang for our buck on that. In addition, because you're now trying to sell an additional $10 million worth of bonds 
in the same in the same five-year period, your interest costs, instead of being $1.3 million or $1.9 million, underwriter's discount is a little bit higher at the $120,000 because that's usually directly related with the par amount of the bonds. And the cost of issuance, um, we've just kept that the same. So here, instead of total savings of $1,969,000, you're saving $1,926,000. So going from a $20 million issue to a $30 million issue, it actually is going to cost the, the district about $43,000. However, you are getting, um, you know, about $600,000 of projects moved up sooner than you would otherwise. So if you were to ask PFM's recommendation at this time, based looking at the numbers that we've been given and the construction costs that we've been given, we think if, if uh, the district were choose to go out with a borrowing, we would probably make a recommendation that the $20 million bond issue would be more beneficial at this time than the $30 million. But keep in mind, it pretty much is almost a wash. It's, I mean, for, for, when you're looking at a $30 and $20 million bond issue, $43,000 is, is a very minimal piece. So I think that, um, you know, that would be based more on policy decision of, of what projects do you want to get done and, and how fast do you want to get those done. So those are the three scenarios that I ran. Um, so I'd like to entertain any questions that you may have or... Um, just get some insight on what you would like to see further from PFM. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. You put this at a one and a half point inflation rate, correct? Yes, that's what your CIP plan is currently escalated at. Is that right, Marsha? Yeah. But the odds are that inflation is going to go up, not down. So our Possibly. savings would be greater if inflation was that's greater right. than 1.5. Yes. yes. Okay. And then if the interest is set, what, it, what we borrow at, that's what it stays throughout the period of the of the bonding that that's correct if you were to sell and and what we did is um, just let's go to just version two and if you go back to exhibit two of version two that is a proposed debt schedule and what we did is we based this off um, the MMD rate which is a triple a rate it's a it's a scale used all over the United States um, for all triple a communities school districts uh, municipalities so we took that rate as of 415, and then we added the pricing the Ankeny School District received off their sale on September, uh, it, last September, and um, which was an A plus, a non BQ issuance. And then we did add about 100 basis points of timing. So in looking at that, that 100 basis points of timing, because we're assuming we probably couldn't get these bonds issued until next spring. Uh, maybe we could do something sooner. That would depend on, you know, your decisions that are being made. But we assume that we would not issue these until May of 2014. And with that, with that 100 basis points of timing, which hopefully we won't need, it, we won't need that, but at some point rates are going to go up. We just don't know when. Um, we've built that in, and it still looks like your true interest rate, which is your average rate over the life of the bonds, would be about 2.2%, which is it's still great, sure. uh, especially for a revenue deal. Um, however, hopefully, if we could get the deal done sooner than later, you know, rates would stay at a level. And once you lock those in, once you sell those bonds, those are set for the life of that five-year bond issue. And, and you said something about we could only move up about $600,000 worth of projects. I didn't quite understand that. If we wanted yeah. 10 extra million. Well, essentially, essentially, I shouldn't say you're moving the product, you're moving $10 million worth of projects up, but the savings that you're going to get is based off that inflationary, how fast, you know, if it's, if it's a project that normally is going to be four years out and I can move it to two years out, we're getting three years of, of deducting that 1.5%. So, yes, you're still going to get the $10 million done sooner, but you're maybe only going to see that 1.5% decreased by one year. So it's, 
it, it's still, you're still getting the $10 million of projects done, but the savings by moving it up to one year was not as significant because we've already taken everything that we can and moved it up to 15. So maybe a 19 project was only moved up to 18. Okay, thank you. Yep. Director Sherwood. Yeah, and just to kind of echo Pat, the uh, that 1.5 sounds awfully low to me. I mean, uh, I've been around construction for a long time, and sheetrock triples in price in, in a year. Uh, concrete, uh, and as Scott knows, this concrete can go right to the roof in five minutes. Uh, that sounds like an awfully low uh, percentage for us to have for the CIP, as a matter of fact. Uh, but taking that extra million, uh, 10 million. Uh, gives us a protection against any inflationary uh, boost that might be above that 1.52. Is that is that true or not? Yeah, yeah, I think that's absolutely fair. I mean, when, whenever you're running models like this, you kind of have to set your assumptions and go with them. Um, and we kept the same assumptions that we had been seeing in the CIP plan, but I would agree with you. That 43,000 difference that I talked about, that could completely go away if inflation is at 2%. Right. Um, and without knowing really where that is or, um, you know, uh, I, that's what we based our analysis on is the no, 1.5. But, yeah, but, you're, abs but you're absolutely nice right. it insurance policy against inflation. You're absolutely right, yes. Anyone else? I've got a question, Jennifer. Yeah. The um, couple of them. One, and and we've got this uh, little flyer on who PFM is. Yeah. Um, can you describe your relationship with uh, the Davenport School District? Yeah. Um, you know, I'll go back, I can go back as far as I've been at PFM, which is 10 years. And I know back at the time, 10 years ago, Davenport School District was one of the first clients that I actually worked on. Um, and I worked with a gentleman named Bob, um, Bob McCauley. And he had worked with the district for many years. Prior to that, um, uh, the district, I believe, had worked with Evanson Dodge, and then PFM purchased Evanson Dodge back in, in 2003. Um, I was hired at that time, and um, although the school district hasn't done a, a lot of, of borrowing, they have done borrowing. PFM has always worked with them um, for many years. It was even just a warrant um, each year, so we've, we've uh, done that. But essentially what PFM does is, is we work for all municipalities um, throughout the state, cities, school districts, um, uh, the state of Iowa, and we are an independent financial advisor, meaning we work for the school district to help you get bonding out into the market, to help you with these types of things, which are planning tools um, and such. And... Um, we're independent financial advisor. We do not underwrite any bonds. Um, so, you know, we've, we've had a long-term relationship with the district, and, and over the years we've worked with Marsha to run some of these different bonding scenarios. Are you a financial advisor? Yes, I am a financial advisor. Okay. Um, and earlier in your presentation, it sounded like, as a financial advisor, you were recommending that version two, if I heard it right, was what you would recommend. Is that correct? Yeah, I will. I will repeat what I was trying to say earlier is I believe that with anything in government, there are policy decisions that need to be made. And so if uh, I think there's two different decisions here, um, the first decision is, and that's why I mentioned version one, can you afford all of these projects and pay for them with cash on hand? That answer is yes. If the, if the district is open to issuing bonds, then my recommendation would be, um, uh, based off our analysis right now, that there is, there is $43,000 of more savings with Exhibit 2 and the $20 million bond issue than Exhibit 3 with the $30 million bond issue. And once again, that is based off of a 1.5% inflationary adjustment in construction costs. And so with that, if you're strictly looking at savings, that is why I based my, my 
recommendation off the 20 million versus the 30 because quantitatively I can tell you that that savings is $43,000 more. So in, in these calculations that you did, there must be a way to determine the, like the optimum amount. Yes. And the optimum, you picked 20 million here and 30 million as examples, but the optimum might be 16 million or 24 million or something. Is, is there a way to calculate that? Yeah, we can, we can work on that. Essentially, here's kind of what we were asked to do. Um, it was uh, brought to my attention that there was a project with the um, auditorium and pool, correct, which roughly was around $20 million. And so with that $20 million that was discussed, that was kind of our version one. And that's why we ran with the $20 million. The $30 million that I also provided you with, and the reason I kept that $30 million in there is because that is what the district had been provided previously, and I wanted to keep uh, consistency with what we had provided you previously. Keep in mind, though, when we previously recommended the, the $30 million, we had had one year more of borrowing in there. The longer we wait, based off your revenue purpose statement, the optimum amount might be something less than that 30 million because we're losing years every year. So now to try to fit the same amount of 30 million in five years versus six years like we had previously shown you, our cash, we can only do that for so long and our cash is gonna go negative because as you increase your bond issue, you're also increasing your debt service payments. And so and so with that, if you could just guess, because because you have this dimin diminishing return basically on the amount that you're bar or the benefit associated with the amount that you're borrowing, if you could guess, what would the optimum amount to bond be? Just take a while to I would guess. say it's something slightly over $20 million. And, and then can you describe, you said earlier, you said, if the district is willing to bond. Yep. And I thought that was an interesting introduction to, to what you were going to say. And could you talk about that, what you mean by that, and what kind of uh, risks there must be with taking on this bonding project? Yep, I absolutely can tell you what I mean by that. I work with many school districts throughout the state of Iowa, and I have some boards that absolutely are not willing to go out to the market to issue bonds for whatever the reason may be. One of the reasons is um, that I most often hear is they don't want to pay the interest income associated with a bond issue. Um, as, as I mentioned before, when you go out and borrow, borrow debt, you're going to be there's gonna be an interest rate associated with that. And whoever purchases this loan or this bond, you're gonna to have to pay interest to, just like you would on a car loan, okay? So I sometimes have uh, school districts say, well, you know what? If I can cash flow this out, even though I can get these same projects done in five or six years, even though there might be inflationary adjustments and costs might go up between now and when I can get them done, because that is an unknown, it, at this time, they may choose to not issue bonds and pay for projects on a cash flow basis, meaning when the revenues are available, that's when they'll get the projects done. That's the number one reason why some school districts choose not to, to do a bond issue. Other school districts, from what we're seeing, and especially now in this very low interest environment, they're saying there isn't a lot of risk right now to bonding interest rates are very low and if we can move up projects and get 20 million or 30 million dollars worth of projects done two or three years earlier than we might have otherwise we think that is that is worth it to go out to the market today and sell these bonds so that we can get all of our projects done sooner and pay a low interest rate since we're in a very low interest rate environment right now so the risk, if you will, of, of what it means by bonding is that you're going to have to pay interest income and some costs of issuance associated with a normal bond transaction. 
which would be in addition to getting the money for your construction project. I just have one last question. Okay. You said uh, if we were to do this, you would anticipate that we would actually be out there selling it in, well, about a year from now. That's a, a completely arbitra arbitrary date. But it assumes a lot of practical things that have to happen between well, now and then. What, here, here's exactly how I got that. I believe that that, was that memo that you sent me from your engineer or your architect? About, and that was specifically rated, related to the um, this auditorium and the pool project. And what we did is we looked at that timing of when we believe your bills will start coming in for that project. So that's, that's exactly where we got that. We could definitely, it usually takes about two months to gear up a bond sale. So if the district did want to move forward with this and get everything started sooner, um, we could sell bonds in two months for the district if that's what you guys chose to do. And that's where I was going was when we when would we need to make a decision? So it, it, it would depend on you guys. Um, you know, I would say that the longer you wait, if we get into another year, then now we're going to have to be looking at trying to fit the same amount of debt service in four years versus five. Um, so we could we could sell bonds in two months. The The reason we use that May date is it just tied into that architect or engineering sheet on your school auditorium of when you thought we thought the invoices would really start coming in for that. Okay, thank you. Any additional discussion? Director Sherwood. Yeah, and the benefit of doing this earlier than later, say two months rather than, as opposed to a year, is that that gives us some protection against inflation in the uh, in the interest rate that's absolutely uh, right and we don't know how long that's going to hold it's been right. there for quite a while but we don't know how long that's going to hold so that would give us some protection against inflation there you're absolutely right thank you director zamora yes uh, and our income from the lost the sales tax is coming in somewhere around 12 million a year our debt service would not be 12 million a year no based off the 30 million dollar bond issue um if you look at exhibit two of the $30 million bond issue, you're looking at about $6.4 million a year in debt service. So the other amount of revenues is going to be used to pay for all of the other projects. And that's why we have moved those up to, um, if you look at, let's say if you look at version three and you go to line uh, 57, that's your unrestricted cash. And so you can see that we've moved up projects to keep that cash positive, but still draw it down significantly. So any money that um, is available in those revenues after you pay for the debt service would be used to pay for other projects. I understand that, but we have the audience, the TV audience listening, yep. and I thought they might want to hear that. No, that's a great question. Director DeFau. Just a couple items. You referenced that the... Uh, the difference in savings was roughly $46,000. But in looking at the calculations that have been provided to us, the total savings for the $30 million plan is 1.944, not 1.926. That's right. We, um, we actually did update. I had an updated version, and I didn't know the savings page was in there. You're absolutely right. We found that um, there, was a, there was a difference that hadn't been accounted for as well as the rounding amount on the bond issue that we didn't include in my numbers. Okay. So there has been an update since that, that version that we ran this morning. Okay. And, and just want one what if for the record, as we know that uh, the legislature approves the local option sales tax um, opportunity for us throughout the state. Um, what if the legislature and our esteemed governor would uh, decide to divert local option sales tax funds to fund education reform. What happens then if we've bonded for this money and all of a sudden our local option sales tax revenue is cut by 50%? I can, I can tell you that if that is to happen, there's going to be the majority of school districts around the state of Iowa that are going to be in the same exact boat. I can't imagine if something, I mean, if something like that happened, uh, we, you definitely need to contact your legislators because that is going to be an issue for the majority of schools 
throughout the state of Iowa right now. Davenport would not be the only school in that situation. I don't know what that outcome would be, but I do know with the low interest rate, uh, there are so many schools that are issuing bonds right now against their local option sales tax because that has been put in place through 2029. But I agree with you, there's, there's always a risk of, associated with that. And as we know, our legislature and governor care so much about the impact of their decisions on budgets of school districts throughout the state of Iowa. Thank you. Is there any additional discussion? Well, if there's none, thank you very much, Jennifer, and uh, yeah. thank you, Marcia, for preparing all this. And if there you know, are other scenarios that you guys would like to see, um, please let us know. Marsha, let us know. We can get those. Um, and now that you're kind of familiar with the cash flows and what they look like and our numbers, um, we can get that updated for you. So just keep us posted, and we'll do what we can to help you out, make the decision for you, help you make the decision. Okay, thank you very President, much. President, can I, can Thanks, I ask Marcia. you a question? Oh, excuse me. Sorry. Uh, just a question. Do you need Do you need Jennifer up? No, 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 no. Oh, thank okay. You. All right. I uh, just want to know what happens to this at this point. What happens now? Well, <clears throat> at this point, the the board has the information that it had asked for, which is what does bonding look like? And I think that the next step would be that somebody on the board would probably have to ask that this go to a uh, to the agenda committee to be considered um, that we actually do something with bonding. Okay, thank you. Is there any additional discussion? Okay, thank you very much. We'll move, move on to textbook adoptions. Julie Szeski will lead us through the discussion. Good evening. Um, over here on the table, we have samples of the adoptions for the following year. Uh, as you know, our committees are made up of parents, teachers, and administrators, and they review um, a variety of materials before making their selection. These selections, some of the um, criteria that they look at are the content, um, curriculum organization of the materials, supplementary materials, um, gender biases, and minority majority evaluations. You'll notice on our adoptions for next year, there's an elementary music adoption, which is very heavy into um, electronic resources and um, uh, whiteboard materials and, and e-books. Uh, the other courses uh, include the French 3 and 4, which actually was approved last year when we came to you for French 1 and 2. We have four AP courses that we're asking for approval. One of them is a new course that will be in ninth grade. Um, we also have a World Studies, which is a new 10th grade course for social studies aligned to the core, and an English 2, which is a 10th grade course aligned to the core. So the reason why we are doing so much work at the high school, not only are these, they're up for adoption, but with the alignment for the core, we start at the high school and work, the state has asked us to start at the high school and work our way down. So these are our adoptions. Uh, we have um, uh, traditionally received $500,000 for um, new adoptions each year, and we do have a carryover, so within the general fund, we will be able to cover the cost of these adoptions. Thank you, Julie. Are there any questions? Any discussion? Uh, Director Crumwoody. Yes, Julie. Under the different areas, um, and there's some math area, some uh, ELA, English language arts area, uh, and some science area, um, and you mentioned the core, mm -hmm. uh, do you have any concerns whatsoever about um, purchasing textbooks uh, if uh, changes are still going on with the core. Um, we feel for several of these adoptions are for AP, and AP um, courses generally have one or two textbooks that are recommended by the college board. So 
we go we will not only look at the recommended books by the college board but then other books that we think are suitable and then come down to our decision um, and all of these are based on the college board recommendations the um, world studies and the english two because we are realigning our courses at the high school to align with the core we started with ninth grade this year 10th grade next year 11th grade and we are very familiar my specialists and the teachers working with them are very familiar with the um, uh, new common core state standards including the new science standards and they have um, that's one of the major things that they look at when they do these adoptions to make sure we're aligning. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Director Sherwood. Uh, would you go over a little bit how we um, assess these textbooks for their uh, their uh, electronic portability, uh, their uh, inter internet access, uh, and this internet support, and, and all those kinds of things? Was there a rubric developed for these, or how did you do it? Anything that's electronic, there's a form that you that you fill out and it's very detailed and it goes to Gary Sloat along with anything that is going to be electronic and then he thoroughly investigates to make sure that it's compatible with our system that we're going to be able to handle it that the installation can be handled at a through a central location and that and so he while we're making the recommendation he does give the final approval for the um, technology knowing that it fits with our district did, did we look at you you're familiar with the concept of bringing your own technology that, that a lot of districts are going to where, where kids have come with their own ipads their own smartphones and so forth mm -hmm. um, did we look at these textbooks in light of that possibility that they would be uh, that they would be able to be accessed by various technology that we don't support necessarily uh, with any of these electronic ebooks or something like that, those would fit onto an iPad or a Chromebook or a anything like that. But uh, um, our technology department has a, ver a very thorough plan of how we are going to be utilizing um, various technology sources. And um, at this time right now, we're, we're just not looking at everybody bringing in their own phone or everybody bringing in their own laptop. We're a very big district with a very limited um, number of techs to be able to support that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any additional discussion? Okay, thank you very much. Thank Julie. you. Move on to boundaries, Superintendent Tate. Thank you, Mr. President. Recollect that at the April 1st Committee of the Whole, we brought in the city maps to show the boundaries for the elementary schools, the feeder systems, and to the intermediate, and to the high schools. And at that time, um, we had consensus on the board, except for one area where there was some discussion about a couple of options. And uh, that was with the Harrison and Fillmore, and at the time, uh, Truman Elementary Schools. So Mr. Martin and I met with uh, Director. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> got it. Yeah. Correct, Director Crumwitty and Director DeFowl, and we talked about the areas that were Harrison, Fillmore, and, and Truman. And what I want to do tonight is show you three of the options because it really does illustrate what we're talking about when we're looking at using our diversity plan and looking at transportation and talking about the utilization for the um, for the building. So I'd like, Scott, to talk you through the three scenarios and then I'll make a recommendation to you. What I'm looking for tonight is taking what we did at the Committee of the Whole, taking what we have tonight, is getting ready for the two public forums we have. Remember, we decided we take the Alice public forums on the 1st of May at Eisenhower and the Sudlow uh, Public Forum on Alice on the 8th of May, and we'd also make them boundary public forum. So we'll widely advertise it, and we'll take out what we did the last meeting and whatever we decide tonight. Right. Thank you, Dr. Tate. Uh, actually, I'm going to start at the back of your presentation, which is Truman. I should have put this as the first page. I, I need to show you these changes first because it, it does affect the other two schools. Uh, Truman, uh, if essentially... Uh, when we had drawn uh, Truman, we borrowed this area right here from Fillmore, 
And this area down below uh, 53rd, down this is 51st right here, if you can see that line, uh, we had borrowed those and, and taken those into Truman. What we've done is, is put those back, and with the exception of keeping this area, because that, that is a walk distance to, uh, to Truman. The other part was, remember, it, the last time that we had come across here at, uh, I think it's 60, 65th Street, we had come across and carved out an area here, and we've put that back in to Fillmore. Uh, another area that we had for Truman early on was this section right here, which is Americana Park. It's 59th Street and uh, Highway 61. We had taken that to Truman because the, all of these students in this area are being bused anyway uh, because there's, there's no connection. These students go to Fillmore. There's no connection. These students go to Harrison. There's no connection. So, so we, we, we went ahead and moved those back. So let's go to let's go to A. That way, gets, that kind of sets the tone for you. Come on. And one thing with Truman, recollect that we're looking at building three to five classrooms in the next two years. So we're keeping that in mind. So if we have building up in the area, or we need to adjust boundary slightly, we will have more room mm -hmm. at Truman. Mm -hmm. So scenario A uh, again captures this area from from that was slated to go to Truman. Uh, the only change is this small area right here, according to our uh, GIS, there's three students that live here, this is, uh, and, and then there's this, to, right on the yellow line is a very large retention pond that the city is putting in. So w essentially we would come, there's a church right here, but we would go to the west, I'm sorry, to the east of the church and cut up, and this is 63rd, it would be the last street in Harrison. And then it, it follows down around uh, and then comes up between these two areas, Americana Park, and then this residential area right here. And so that, that's the original uh, Fillmore uh, boundary with, with this small exception and this area that we gave to Truman. Before you move to that, I'd mm -hmm. like to point out, with this A, um, Fillmore is 79% utilized, and its A to B ratio is 3.18. Uh, with the A, Harrison is 97% full, so it still is pretty packed. And its ratio of A to B students is 1.01. And, 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 and I, sh I should say that, you know, it, this is a long, long ways off, but in my packet tonight, there, there was a, uh, a preliminary plat for uh, 48 home sites right here, and, th and that would connect to this part. Uh, I think it's hard to tell from the from the preliminary plat, but I think it's connecting here in uh, either 61st or or uh, 63rd at some point. So, but that will connect these, but it will not allow them to go directly to Fillmore. Yes. If I may, I was able to uh, review that map on a PDF, and the western boundary of that subdivision is Marquette. It, it's that's right. That's right. So so this this would this would be Marquette. This would be Marquette, right, about right here, and connecting to, to these neighborhoods right here. So this, this section right here would be those 48 home sites. But Scott, do yes. you keep saying 53rd. Isn't Harrison on 53rd? 53rd's down here. This is 63rd, I'm sorry. 63rd. 63rd. Uh, maybe I'm not hearing you well. Yeah, <laughs> cotton mouth. I'm okay. sorry. Uh, yes, this is 63rd right here. Okay. Any, any other questions? Uh, and then, then Fillmore scenario B. Pull uh, it down so you can see it a little bit. Uh, what it, what it does is it, it maintains this same leg. Actually, it starts here at Wood. So there, there was a couple houses here that really you know uh, should be going to Fillmore. We're going to bus kids. If this was if it was Harrison, we'd be busing them from there because they would have to. Uh, there really is not a good way for them to get there. There's no connecting streets until they get down, uh, and then they're walking along uh, Northwest Boulevard. So we, we took this area, and uh, then these homes, there's no students that show that live here right now, but with the exception of these three. And this comes across at uh, 59th right here. This is 59th. It shows that the northern part of Harrison uh, above 59th to 63rd would would go to Fillmore, and then then we kept the rest of the boundary at, as it was. Any questions on on B? 
how does that change the usage percentages? Okay, on the usage for Fillmore would be 86%. The usage for Harrison would be 87%. The A to B ratio for Fillmore would be 2.38, so it's better than the uh, A scenario, and Harrison would be 1.00 A to B ratio. Okay, and then we'll move to C. Uh, C keeps the rest of the western boundaries, but it, it, it puts this area from 59th to 63rd back into Harrison and moves Americana Park or, or this area. I'm not sure what this cross street is right here, but uh, essentially it just ends right in the middle of the neighborhood, and, and then that would go to Fillmore. So the, these students would still be bused, but again, they, they are being bused to, to Harrison now. And the rest of the boundary stays the same. So the utilization for Fillmore would be 89%. And there's, there's a chart we've given you for Harrison, it'd be 87. The A to B ratios for Fillmore would be the worst of the three. It'd be 3.27, meaning a larger number. And Harrison would go to less than one of 0.88. So this is almost classic about looking at, you know, what's important to you in the way of certainly building utilization, but also uh, your diversity plan of balancing the A to the B ratios. Mm -hmm. I, I will mention I turned on the air conditioning. I turned it up a little bit. So if that, if that will help. I'm sorry. I wasn't sweating back there. I am now. I, I, I wasn't earlier. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, and so A in this case, 97% Harrison is just, we haven't done much. If you mm -hmm. took A, we, you know, the whole point was that that's where it started at Harrison to make it uh, have more room. So I, I would say A would be a non-starter, and then you've got the, the B and the C's. Okay. So this is Harrison scenario A. Uh, again, we just have this jog uh, to the west, but this is essentially Harrison as it is now, with with, with that exception, with without that those three students. So, uh, just like uh, Fillmore was in in, in uh, Fillmore A. Any any questions? Probably wait till we get to B. Scott, yes. That area once again. That this. The blue area that now is going to go to Fillmore. Uh, now over. This one. Oh, over here. Not that far. This one? <laughs> the blue. The blue. Oh, this area right here. Yeah, yeah. Ah, gotcha. <laughs> can you, can that is blue. Explain what those boundaries are, those streets that you've taken. You've gone from. Uh, is this Northwest Boulevard. Boulevard up to. Up to, well, I don't know. There's not a road, actually. There's a church. Uh, directly east of it is, I think, 59th. And, and then uh, essentially it just it cuts right through the middle of that storm retainage area up, up to 63rd. So 63rd would be the last street in, in Harrison as it, is, as it is now. And so 63rd uh, from Northwest Boulevard up to 63rd on the left of your cursor there. Yes. So from Northwest Boulevard to 63rd would now go to Fillmore. Correct. And what is the boundary now? What is, what is the boundary now? Yeah. Well, it, it's, it's, uh, uh, is, it, is this, I can't, is it, this must be 63rd where it comes, or 62nd right here. Uh, so it would be the corner of division and uh, probably 63rd. Whoops, sorry. Yeah. This is scenario A. Scenario A. The yes. For yes. For Harrison. Yeah. Okay. Any further questions? Anybody? Well, I have two more. He's going to run through. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. I, 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 I wonder if there's any more questions on A. <laughs> sorry, I'm trying to make the meeting shorter. Okay, I, I, and I'm running fast. Yeah, please. Uh, so, so, he, so here's Harrison's scenario B, and essentially this is uh, 
Fillmore scenario be where this section above 59th goes to Fillmore and everything else uh, would, would stay the same for Harrison. Scenario C includes, uh, as it does for Fillmore, it, it includes this area for Harrison but drops out this area for Fillmore. But interferes with our diversity goals. Yes, I, I, that's Dr. Tate, I think, has that paperwork. And Worst it situation would. if you're trying to balance the diversity, B is the best. Oh. Okay, that, that's all of them. <laughs> Sorry, Director Johansson. <laughs> I gave you a false start. All right, are you ready for questions sure. now? Any questions? We do, we do have the maps uh, up here uh, before those changes were made in case you want to look at them. Okay, comments, discussion? Director DeFile. I don't know that it's a question as much as it is an observation, uh, but in scenario B, by moving that line, that north boundary of Harrison down to 59th, um, it allows that contiguous area that will be this Lombard addition because it runs east to De Goose Creek and west to Marquette, it allows that neighborhood to all be in the same attendance center. That makes sense to me, as we all know that the only building in that area at this point in time that can sustain growth is Fillmore. Any additional discussion? Yes, Mr. Director Crumwoody. First of all, I appreciate you taking a look at other scenarios um, and uh, the meeting that we had because I thought it was beneficial to all of us to have that conversation. My, um, I also had some communication with the city planning office and uh, about that whole area north, north of Harrison School uh, and east of Division Street present time that's probably one of the fastest growing areas in the city right now um, and uh, from the conversations that I had is that there's no intention right now of putting streets through to division so we would be adding additional busing uh, to take those students out of the Harrison area and busing them because you have to come all the way around Marquette and then back up Division Street to get to Fillmore. It was also explained to me that uh, it's not up to the city to actually make that decision. It's gonna be the developer that makes that decision. And then also if that decision is made, then those um, those folks that live out in that, that area will be assessed for those streets to come through. So um, that was um, an eye opener to me because I thought um, those streets would be coming through in the near future, like a year or two from now, but uh, it doesn't sound like it's even on the planning, in the planning right now. So in looking at that right now, I'm thinking we got, and I explained this the last time, we have students that live um, six or seven blocks from Harrison who are walkers to Harrison School, and um, we're gonna end up now busing them, uh, and help me understand numbers, 50? Uh, yeah, like 50 depending students. on the age group, 50 to 60. Now we're gonna pick up from that area and bus them, bus them over to to um, Fillmore School. Um, that, that concerns me because those people right now, and uh, I think I mentioned also, one of my favorite things to do besides gardening is go to, to um, open houses. And by the way, our new student open, the student building program, they're building a house right now in that area, which was open. It's on the Parade of Homes. And um, 
I just happened to pick up the flyer and they, the realtors are telling everybody right now buying those homes that Harrison was, is in with, within their school district and they're only six or seven blocks away from school. Now we're gonna suggest that they go to Fillmore and we're gonna bust them, which is also gonna add expenses to us if we're gonna add additional busing. Um, the, um, the area of Truman that was designated, or the area of um, Goose Creek that was designated to Truman, I appreciate that decision because again, we would have added more busing to take those students to uh, way over to Truman from Goose Creek. So those were my two, two biggest concerns. Um, and as we know, we should be looking at these boundaries every five years. And in three or four or five years, whenever developers decide to make up their mind about bringing those streets through, then I think we need to be changing those boundaries. But I'm concerned about moving those Harrison families right now. And if we say, okay, we're gonna go to 63rd to Harrison School and then that's it, anybody further north is now gonna go to Fillmore School. Um, the diversity situation is a concern of mine, I think. Um, so I, I think that, um, I think that we really, if we're going to do this and take all those 50 kids out of that area, um, and Dr. Tate, you sent us information about these parent meetings. I think we need to have more than two. Uh, I would suggest that one of those, and I don't know, uh, Rich, maybe you can help, help us out. Does Goose Creek have a facility that they could have a parent meeting? I think, there not there a new? Facility enrichment center. It's not built yet. It seems to me we, we're gonna have a lot of parents out there that are not gonna be made aware of all of these changes. Um, so I would hope that we would have these parent meetings in areas that are affected. Um, because right now, none of the parent meetings are scheduled around that area for Harrison or North or Wood. I would think we'd wanna have that those parents involved um, in those meetings. Uh, and I think it was brought to our attention. The first recommend, or the last recommendation that was made um, when we started all of these uh, parent meetings, these people have had like three months to come forward and talk to us. And now they're gonna have very little time to do that. So I think we need to go to them as much as possible and accommodate them. Um, we've certainly accommodated other areas uh, in the past as far as the number of meetings that we've had, the number of open forums, and we all know that we've had numerous people come forward during open forums. Those people have had lots of opportunities to express their concerns these people with two, only two meetings and not even in the this area that we're talking about tonight concerns me a lot. <coughs> Hang on just a minute. Uh, <coughs> Director Crumwoody, you didn't, at least I didn't catch, uh, if you expressed a preference for any of these particular um, options that have been presented. Not yet, I haven't. Is that the question that you're asking? Well, I think, I, I think that that's part of what the superintendent was, was looking for is a little bit more guidance because we are not going to go out and have a bunch of forums where we're going to ask people what they want to do. We've had those forums, and in fact, those forums were, uh, everybody was invited. Um, so, but. The people were invited, Mr. President, Everybody was invited, but many of those people weren't affected, and that's my concern. Now, we've changed that, and those people who are now affected 
didn't really understand what was going on. We had a whole bunch of people come from an area of town here that they knew and they knew really well that their area was affected and we heard from them. We haven't given all of these other people in Goose Creek uh, and the people north of Harrison, those people aren't even aware of it right now and that's why I'm concerned about giving them time to understand what's going on. <clears throat> okay, additional discussion. Director DeFile. I, I do appreciate Director Cromwitty's concern about future development. I would point out in looking at this map and looking at the zoning information that we received today that if in fact we keep that boundary south and at 63rd, we're going to be splitting this neighborhood that's being proposed between Fillmore and Harrison. Because if you look at where Goose Creek runs and if it's gonna connect between that Fillmore right there and over to Marquette, we're then in essence splitting a neighborhood between two elementary schools. And it makes sense to me to shift that boundary south now, again, knowing that there's only one building in that area that can accommodate students sufficiently. And also, um, in also appreciating the need for maintaining diversity in our buildings, scenario B does provide the most benefit in influencing the diversity of both Fillmore and Harrison. Mr. President, uh, was, he was first. Yeah, I, I was going to acknowledge uh, Director Robertson. Yeah. Okay, Director Robertson. <coughs> Just very quickly, uh, when I take a look at how the, the portion that you've carved out, and, and I made the statement before that you're saying that they will not go to Harrison when you get past 63rd and you get into 65th, 67th, and 68th. Uh, those students are not attending our schools. I watched the bus, I watched their clothing. They're not going to our schools. So the conversation they have with me is that their intentions were when they purchased those homes where they were going to go to Harrison. And then when they found out that it was differently, I see them going to private schools and I also see them putting their houses up for sale and they're relocating. So even though we talked about the best scenario and what we've done, they're, they're not going, I, I see it every day, they're not going to our schools. They're going to private schools. Thank you. Director Zamora. Yeah, I think we should be honest with ourselves and say, if you look at C, what you're doing is creating another school who people will have the perception that this is a poor school and they don't want to go there. And I think that that's a mistake because if you, you know, as we all know, that Americana Park contains a lower uh, socioeconomic group of people and if you add them to Fillmore now, all you're doing is creating another school that people are going to look at and say, oh, we don't want to go there, our kids shouldn't be there. And I think it would be a big mistake to, to further that view. I think we need to do a better job of mixing up all the people. And that's why I think B is the only one we can look at out of those three. Additional discussion. Director Crumody. I'm not sure I understood, Director Robertson, uh, when you were saying north of 63rd. We are now going up to 59th. Fifteen. No, it ends at 63rd out there. We, Scott and I drove it. Yeah. The newest Eventually, edition, there'll be 65th, 63rd. 67th. Eventually, but right now mm -hmm. we're on, we're going up to 59th. Kids that live six or seven blocks from Harrison, and those kids will now go to Fillmore. No, I'm talking about the part. Yeah. That, <coughs> that's the part that you carved out that people were going when they were. Oh, home. I know. That they were going to go to Harrison. Yeah. I'm saying, and I watch with regularity. Those kids do not attend our school. They go to private schools because I see that. Today. And if I understand, Scott said we pull three kids out of that area, but that area from 59th to 63rd, we pull 51 kids. There are more than three kids because I see two buses coming through there every day. And I, all I'm saying that is that 
the conversation that people will have with me in their neighborhood, they tell me that they purchase houses with the idea that their kids are going to go to Harrison. And mm -hmm. You've heard me say this many, many times. People buy where they want their kids to go to school. And then when they find out that they're not going to go, they end up sending their kids to private schools or they relocate. Okay, ma'am, uh, Mr. President. Yeah, yeah, I've got to stop the debate. I just want to debate. comment quickly to his because I want to stop too. But you know what? The people who buy those houses next will know they're going to Fillmore. So that problem won't be there. And we'll be changing boundaries in five years anyway. Okay. So I want to get back to uh, discussion at the board level. Uh, Director Crumwitty, did you have more to discuss? Um, no. I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. Is there any additional discussion on this matter? I uh, would just like to state from what I heard, I was going to go forward with scenario B for public discussion. Well, and and I still wanted to weigh in. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's <laughs> okay. Me. It's all right. I, I, <laughs> I was going to weigh in and favor uh, scenario B. And I think all I've heard is uh, then three um, advocacies for B and no advocacies for either one, either of the other two scenarios. So, Superintendent Tate, did you have more to say? No, and I'm sorry for interrupting you. <laughs> it's quite all right. If there's no more discussion, we'll move on to the District of Distinction report. Thank you. This won't uh, be long. The uh, District of Distinction Committee came about because you advised us last year to be bold, and we've been meeting for about a year. Board members have uh, stopped by or have served the entire time. We have done a lot of work. We've had aldermen and the president of the Chamber of Commerce and the mayor and people from our schools and um, universities that have just looked at a whole host of things that our people are doing throughout the nation. And I provided you a chart of where we have landed for right now and things that we're looking at doing in the future to become a district of distinction. Um, we're going to try to come back to you in June and be more methodical and have committees actually report to you. But I want to let you know that uh, one of the things we're, do we're looking at is a dual graduation program. Someone will graduate from high school with an associate degree from Scott Community College. We have a career institute, which is actually the STEM program, a creative arts academy, which will be down at the Figgy, the Adler, and the RME and the library downtown, and uh, Intermediate School of, a of Athletics um, that we're looking at, foreign language at all of our elementary schools, and then an international baccalaureate program. So we have subcommittees that are looking ahead at when we should start um, these cohorts in, in, in our schools and when we can actively be marketing, and you can see on the chart I want to indicate the one thing we think we can begin right now, there may be more, is a dual graduation AA program, which will be at North High School. We actually are beginning to identify uh, two 20-student cohorts. If you will look uh, attached, you will see the initial program and how a student could actually in four years graduate from high school as well as having an associate degree from college. And if you think about the savings alone for a parent with that sort of a program, it is amazing. So I want to at least let you know that one is on a fast track. We'll provide you more information in June. Um, what we're, Our initial thought is to actually pick the uh, students in those cohorts to make sure that we have a representative of our diversity in the district. And uh, we're about that right now. So again, I, it is short. We're going to give you more meet when we come back in June, but I wanted to at least keep you apprised of where we're going with this exciting program. Any questions or discussion, Director DeFau? Yeah, and it's nothing I expect you to be able to answer tonight, but as you're looking especially at the, uh, the dual enrollment program, I'm wondering what implications that has for students that do not choose to participate in that cohort system, but will intend to take AP classes. Are AP classes going to be skewed to that cohort of identified students so that AP will be less available to general student population? I don't think so. I haven't heard anything of that nature, but we'll certainly look at it. It's going to be that these cohorts will fit into AP, or in some cases we would 
construction may be courses for them, but we'll keep, we'll make sure that's not going to happen. But knowing there are only so many resources in a building in terms of FTEs to, I, I just would, I would hate to create a program that then is going to negatively impact the opportunities for our general sure. student population that isn't part of that cohort. Sure. Director Zamar. Any additional discussion, Director Sherwood? Just, a, a, I'm curious. You have the uh, uh, start marketing now. I assume the three X's means it's a higher priority. Um, and I'm curious because of the discussions in the committee uh, talk about the Creative Arts, Arts Academy, which you have a two X, um, where it, it doesn't require a building yet the STEM program requires a new building. Uh, what's your reasoning for having that a higher priority for marketing now than the Creative Arts Academy? Well, right now the feeling is STEM. We've already got STEM in West High School, so we've got this. We've got its the core right there. So we probably just build upon that. So, um, I mean, Jason is ready to go, and he wants to sort of begin to form the core of the Career Institute. So that's why we have Triple X, and I think we can. You know, it says. A few students as a vanguard set up a trial now. So you, your vision is that you would begin this at West as, a, as the STEM uh, program and advertise that and as we are able to move that to an independent location? Well, if we, if we can move it to an independent. But remember, we have ProStart at Central, and that will be part of any career institute that we have. So it's just that a matter when you're talking about uh, STEM itself and our engineering, we've got that right now with Project Lead the Way. But I don't think we talked about the separate building for STEM. Oh, a little bit. We were dreaming, yeah. yes. And and the mayor promised when he gets his casino. <laughs> <laughs> Any additional discussion? All right. We'll move on to administrative reports. None for me, Mr. President. Okay. Thank you. Are there any board reports or requests? Yeah, I've got these. Anybody else? Director Kluhl, did you have something? Well, I just wanted to quickly mention a couple of events that have happened. Uh, one, the board, in honor of our diverse community, has spent time together talking about diversity uh, in our district. We spent a couple, we spent probably five hours total uh, in meetings talking about what we can do to enhance the diversity in our community. Uh, an interesting thing, a comment came up uh, during that session and it was that um, a statement made that school districts, schools can overcome the dysfunctional families and bad parenting. Um, I'm still working on that. But it's interesting that that came up as an absolute. The director that uh, gave us that presentation, the professor from Western Illinois, said that with absolute certainty. Interestingly enough, um, Director Crumwoody and myself and Dr. Tate attended an AEA uh, banquet uh, last week. And the speaker there said very much the same thing. And so what this is all about is essentially 90-90-90. And I've never paid close attention to it, but it's something that uh, I'm looking into. And, and for Mr. Axe's class, I, I hope that sometime in the future you attend a board meeting where we're talking about big conversation issues like uh, what will we do for our schools? How will we move ahead? How will we, how will we honor our diversity and use it for learning in our schools rather than spending time talking about boundary lines in our school district, which is important. But we do have an administration that is spending time doing that, and I hope that this board soon gets back on track and starts talking about the issues that we've been elected to deal with, not administrative issues. Anything else? All right, I've got three requests here. First is <clears throat> from Director Sherwood, date 4-22-13, information request. I'd like an administration recommendation for or against bonding for OIP, CIP, excuse me. And and what what is that? Yeah. 
Okay. And what does CIP stand for? Yeah, it's a term to use. I don't know. Okay. This might be Ralph's. All right. Second is a request from Director Cluel dated. Uh, April 22nd, information request, request update on policy committee's conversation on the diversity plan. Third is from Director Sherwood, date April 22nd, 2013, agenda item, agenda discussion of issuing CIP bonds. Uh, Director DeFau. Just an observation that I believe that the agenda committee is considering an agenda item to discuss the boundary conversation or the diversity plan conversation we had and Mary should be able to distribute minutes because we did record so that you know we could take detailed minutes of that conversation okay very good thank you um, that's it <coughs> is there a motion to adjourn so moved second second all those in favor say aye aye, aye. this meeting is adjourned oh, that's yours too. I got one